quick trigger warning, this video includes a discussion of the harsh treatment experienced by Africans during the transatlantic slave trade. This content is disturbing, so I encourage everyone to prepare themselves emotionally before proceeding. If you believe that this content will be traumatizing for you, I recommend you skip this video and watch some of our more lighthearted content on the channel. Most of these other places, Maybe you know, they'll go and show you the door of no return and that type of thing. What we have here is, once they came out here, you see these stones? You see how they, they, they turn? The guy down there is the original jetty. Where you saw the, the cannon? Where you saw that's the cannon? That's the original jetty. jetty. Okay. Yes. It's not the door of no return. We have a path of no return. Because once those are enslaved Africans made this left turn. That was it. When no they turn west, they kept on going, they kept going west of the Americans. Oh. What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Joanna Sergio Hatagua. I'm a Sierra Leonean American living in Accra, Ghana. And if you want to know about the history of slave castles in Sierra Leone, then this is the video for you. Okay, cool. So we are going to see what we call the door of no return for Sierra Leone, or also known as the path of no return. It's recently been given that name since the door of no return for Ghana has become such a popular name and Sierra Leone has its own version of that. And so we're going to be exploring that today. So this is part two in a two part series about Bunce Island, the Bunce Island slave castle in Sierra Leone. If you remember part one, it was kind of what the journey is like to get to the slave castle. And then a little bit of history of the tribes there locally and, and how it was formed into a chieftaincy. Um, now we're gonna go into the slave castle and talk more about its history um, and basically how it was all set up and even hear some stories about how the slaves were kept and then learn a little bit more about why it's been destroyed and it's so dilapidated and then the process that they're going through for trying to restore it as well. So before we even get into the tour of the slave castle, let me give you a little bit of history on Bunce Island because again, it's been destroyed, it looks dilapidated, it's very different from what you've seen when I went to the slave castles in Ghana. Um, it's a very different experience, so let me talk you through what actually happened here. So Bunce Island was so central to the British slave trade that the castle was looted, attacked, destroyed, and rebuilt many times. The French actually destroyed it four times, 1695, 1704, 1779, and 70, 1794. Pirates also looted it twice in 1719 and 1720. And it was burnt down by the Afro-Portuguese slave trader Jose Lopez in 1728. So the remains of the slave castle that, uh, that is there now was rebuilt after it was destroyed in 1794. Now the British abolished the transatlantic slave trade in 1807 and slave trafficking was stopped at Bunce Island almost immediately. So after the significant human trafficking from Sierra Leone, it was to Sierra Leone in 1792 that 1,131 out of the 1,196 freed black slaves from Nova Scotia returned to and established what is now Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. Two years after Freetown was established, it was attacked and ransacked by the French who also destroyed the slave castle at Bunce Island. Despite a few British abolitionists who helped resettle the black Nova Scotians and rallied against slavery, slavery was still a significant and profitable operation for the Europeans, including the British. Thus, in 1796, just two years after the French attack, a new slave castle had been built at Bunce Island. Perhaps the most ironic and inconceivable of all is that this slave castle was rebuilt by the labor of many of the Nova Scotians who were actually freed slaves that returned to Sierra Leone. Bunce Island would continue to be the hub for the British slave trade for another 11 years until it was officially abolished by the British, British government in 1807. Historically, Sierra Leone is the only place in Africa that was central to the transatlantic slave trade and where the first freed slaves from America returned to in effect, completing the circle, establishing Freetown, which is now the capital of Sierra Leone. 
I think it's a really impactful and interesting story and not many people know it. And so I wanted to make sure I gave you guys all of that information, that history, before we jumped into this Slave Castle tour. So, without further ado, check it out. This was the South Bastion. And you see the bit in the middle here, where the stones look a little different, it doesn't have any plaster, is the area that had collapsed. Mm -hmm. All right? And part of preservation work is, is, you know, we knew if we didn't do something, you see that other wall I would sleep in? If we didn't do something to, to restore it, rebuild, everything, rebuild. That, that, would, yeah. that would collapse as well. A lot of people have said, oh, let's rebuild, let's rebuild. Yeah. You cannot just rebuild, you have to justify. Mm -hmm. We rebuilt part of the fault, but the justification is that we did it to stabilize the rest of the fault. This is the outside fortification wall. We are outside the fort itself now. This is the outside fortification wall. It runs right around the fort, except in areas where the, the wall was deliberately knocked down because they wanted to extend their fort. At its highest, it is 40 feet high and it has it had broken bottles embedded on the top of it. There are lots of security features that we point out as we go around. Somebody was asking, did anybody ever escape at the answer is no, because there are lots of security features. That we point out. Now, if you look at the wall, right to where the texture changes, right here, this structure here is the merchant's dormitory, and it might be the oldest structure on the island. Talk soon, I can't be Behind us is the trading area. This is where traders from the west met traders from the interior. This is the trading area. On my right is the well. The well is the oldest archaeological feature of this island. Most of these other places, you know, they'll go and show you the door of no return and that type of thing. What we have here is, once they came out here, you see these stones? You see how they, they, they turn? Yeah. Guy right down there is the original jetty. Where you saw the, the cannon? Where you saw the, the cannon? Original That's the original jetty. jetty. Okay. Yes. It's not the door of no return. We have a path of no return. Because once those enslaved Africans made this left turn, that was it. When no they turned west, they kept on going west to the Americans. This is the merchant's quarters. You see, you have cannons lying in the cutting wall. There are eight cannons still surviving. There are 16 cannons, four in each of these semicircular bastions. The cannon holes we have filled in when the inner wall was put in. These um, um, cannons were brought in after the 1794 attack. It was brought there in the reign of King George III. You can see the crown, you can see Rex three. You can see three here for, 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 for the third, and you can see G. So it was brought in during the reign of King George III after the 1794 attack. So a brief talk about the military history of, of Bones Island. Uh, Mel already said it was attacked like four or five times by the, by the French and the Portuguese or whatever. When you see these cannons, you'll be misled into thinking that, oh, this book could defend the fort. They could never effectively defend the fort. They were sure that they were not soldiers. So in the event that they were attacked, they would use these cannons to fire cannonballs just to delay the landing of the attackers long enough <laughs> for them to collect their the and, and escape from the upriver beach flee to a friendly African yeah. village or to yeah. places like Rotumba, yeah. wait out the attack after their attackers have plundered or burned down their foot and leave, then they will come back and rebuild. This house was built in a semi-tropical design, like you go, this plantation house, yeah. exactly, it looks like that. Inside a veranda, 
wraps around on three sides of the of the triangle as the one that wraps around. You can even see the, the of the structure. The children will try in, in school. Now, Bones Island is is uh, is an is, is means something different to everybody. So the captives, it was a dungeon, it was a slaveyard, it was a prison. So the traders, it was home. It was their mansion, it was their whatever. It was luxury. So the free, the grumetis, it was their place of employment, it was their office space. So it's so the, the king by, by summer, these were his customers, his clients, his, his tenants. You know, so it means different things to different people over time, depending on who you are or what purpose you, you serve. That's the fireplace that they talked about, but it was for appearances only. They actually didn't use it as a fireplace because this was supposed to be luxury housing. They uh, built a fireplace that looked like a fireplace, even though they didn't actually have a fireplace. You can see the space for where the second floor was. So that's what's left of what the second floor is because there was so much damage over time. Um, that was one of the other exits. There are accounts of people who actually visited this island while it was in operation and they wrote accounts of their visit here, first hand, first written mm -hmm. accounts. That's one of the major sources of our information. One such person is Anna Maria Falcon Bridge. Mm -hmm. You all hear Falcon Bridge, Falcon Bridge, now like a man. Falcon Bridge was an officer of the Sierra Leone Company mm -hmm. who was sent here to negotiate for the lease of the land for, for the settlement the of the town. For this was the kitchen and forge, now mm -hmm. them they cook for them and then forge with them they make all the, the metal, metal, stuff, metal work the shackles and what have you, yeah. blacksmith mm -hmm. they said there was a cannon facing the into the slave yard to deter slaves from trying to escape 100 years of being deserted, this is what has grown it's now part of the land, you can't do anything without it you can't do anything about it, the, the actual the roots go out of the ground, up the tree, up here. You come into this space and this door will be locked behind you. And if you wanted to go into the women's slavery, that door will open for you, or the male slavery, or whatever. Like if you come with the meals, or to apply shackles, this is where you will come through. So we're going to go into the women and children's slavery at first. Women and children. The women's side, the men's side. The women and children's slave yard we're walking into right now. We are in the women and children's slave yard. This is much smaller than a male slave yard. And you can notice that the, the outer wall was has been knocked down. It was actually knocked down because the traders wanted to extend their force. Unfortunately for them, the transatlantic slave trade was abolished right, up, right around there and then the company was compensated for the loss of the investment. So my right is a structure where um, um, there is a latrine and then there is a room in that structure. We do not know for sure what it was used for, but speculation is that that was where the female captives were raped. So they, they wanted some female captives because they will give back to offsprings who will be born into slavery, but the women also served to satisfy the slave traders' sexual fantasies. Because they were raped, we all know that. Those people, they were regularly raped, and the children could be brainwashed into submission by the time they grow up. They are well conditioned and brainwashed, and they will be um, submissive slaves. So, if a child was deemed strong enough to survive the middle passage, they will be bought and sold and taken on the middle passage to one of those plantations, either in the West Indies or in the South Carolina and. and Georgia. So you can see there is a connecting door between the, between the women's slavery and the male slavery. This was an arch doorway. It collapsed maybe in 2016-17. Actually, we, we could not justify rebuilding that because there was no um, um, engineering reason to, to, to stabilize. But we had some, some, over, some, some hanging walls, so we built up some of the, the walls to support that just to stabilize it. So these are the male slave yard. Male slave yard. And in case you are wondering, was there a roof? Was, why is it open here? It was always open air, but they built wooden huts, bafans. Slave trading was done in the dry season. 
never in the rainy season because remember number one the things that brought down riverways and during the dry season during the rainy season the ground is not safe and you cannot protect them from the rain during the rain so trading was done in the dry season and the big bathans to offer some shelter you can see that the male slave that is way bigger and the female slave that they prefer more male slave age between 15 and 30 years yeah, yeah, yeah. no 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 you see what in Anne Marie has say Falcon Bridge is that the slaves were kept in groups of 10 in a circle chains chain. chain chain, together yeah. in a circle and when you are feeding them you can put chain, it chain. put middle, middle them so there's no way they could go you you are in a circle you move personal <laughs> ten group <laughs> and where was that up here you see that hole and there was a veranda with with arm guards when they watch them now out of one window then they and a maria so understand they all they understand then they all know them back for them they build back for them they build them wooden huts young boy as a, as a captive and he was meant to be put on board a slave ship to be taken away mm -hmm. now he hid on the island until the slave ship left and then he showed himself to the slave trader mm -hmm. so they were like oh my god he's so smart he's so cute how oh, he, 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 he you know he was able to hide until the, the ship left so we're not gonna send him to stay we're gonna raise you ourselves so he was actually raised on this island by the slave traders and he became a faithful agent well faithful quote unquote agent of the traders here but what he, he was not called by tribe what he used to do is they, he was one of the factors. Remember, I mentioned that they had agents stationed out to yeah. go on expeditions to go and collect capital. Gombusmas was one such agent. They trusted him so much that they would give him a lot of trade goods and send him up, with, up into the country to get to go and do battle to exchange. What he would do if he purchases a captive and the captive was a local, he would not bring the local, no, not the release him. He formed a settlement, Rokong. Rokong. He formed a settlement, Rokong. And he would he would siphon off his local people and send them to Roko and form the settlement. That's why he was hiding his local people. You know, he was not bringing them down here to be sold to sent to the slavery. He would buy them and then keep them as Roko. When Roko became a big, a big, big enough settlement and he had enough resources, he went on one shipping and never came and never came back. So we just got the tour of Buns Island. It is a really powerful tour. It's really hard to describe everything that we learned here. All of what we have here is from first-hand accounts from the uh, Sierra Leoneans that are descendants of people who lived and worked here, but then also the Europeans who visited and actually wrote down in journals what it was that they saw. And so we have this extensive history here, but really not really well known by anybody else outside of here or even anybody in the country. So look, if you come to Sierra Leone, make sure you find this group and come out to this place. It's really, really, really important to see. And here is what we would call the path of no return instead of the door of no return. So from here, if you want to point up there, you can see that path there from this doorway up here. They came down here all the way down and then they were boarded onto the ships here. And that's the path of no return. So whereas other countries have the door of no return, this is the path of no return. Man, so guys, you know, if you want to hear more stories about this, you want to learn more about the history of Sierra Leone, check out some more of my videos on my channel. I got a bunch of videos about Sierra Leone and I got more coming about the history of Sierra Leone. If you're interested at all in African history, there's a ton of that here. And then also what it's been like for me to move here to the continent. It's not all uh, this kind of content. But if you find it interesting, go ahead and like, hit that like button, comment, subscribe, share it with people who don't know this information that could use this insight and this information to learn more about what's happened in Sierra Leone. Hit that notification bell so you're updated every time a new video comes out. All right guys, with that, that's everything. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you all in the next video.